a key component of mass spectrometry, whether it's uh, small molecules, proteins, peptides, is very often separations. So uh, we built into the program a lecture on separations, and uh, this year we have Professor Bob Kennedy from the University of Michigan, who's a separations expert, who's going to lead this lecture. So Professor Kennedy, it's all yours. Thank you. So it's uh, really been great to be here this morning, and I really enjoyed especially the uh, flash talks and seeing what was going on out there. And uh, I was a little daunted by having the third lecture right before lunch, but Josh built in that break, and that hopefully gave you a little bit of uh, more energy to get through until that, the lunch coming up. But um, yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit. I'm from the University of Michigan, and I'm going to talk a little bit about separations today. And I'll just, you know, caveat here is I, when I teach my undergraduate class, we have at least four or five lectures on separations, and I teach a whole course on separations for grad school. So the one hour here, we're probably going to be able to hit the highlights. Um, and also, before I get started, I want to thank uh, Evgenia from Josh's lab, who uh, put together the original slides, and I modified them a little bit for today. So a little bit about what I want to achieve today is, uh, you know, it's called a mass spectrometry school. And I want to, and here I am talking about chromatography. So I definitely feel like your vegetables on a nice plate of, uh, of a meal that you might have that you may not care for, but you need them. So I want to explain uh, a little bit about why we need separations and then talk a little about some of the terms, a little bit of basics there in chromatography and separations and how they can benefit an, uh, a mass spec analysis. And then we'll get into some specifics on what we call uh, unidimensional or one-dimensional separations. 2D separations, two-dimensional, and then finally some practical stuff at the end. So let's talk a little bit first about the motivation for uh, separations. And this is a proteome example, but you can make the same argument for a metabolome or lipidome example, I think. So if you start off with 20,000 canonical sequences or proteins, and that's already a really complex mixture that would be very challenging for a mass spectrometer to look at on its own. But then you digest it, as we do for proteomics, uh, bottom-up proteomics. You're talking about making a mixture now from 20,000 up to over a million compounds. And then, and that's assuming you have perfect cleavages and no modifications. Now, if you add in the reality that the, you don't digest at every single site uh, for every single protein, and so you get some different kind of mis cleavages as well as all kinds of variations in the amino acids, you're talking about over 10 million potential compounds in a mixture. That is a staggeringly large number of compounds in that little tube that you just added the trypsin to. Second thing is they're not all present at equal concentrations. You all already know that, I'm sure. Uh, but it's pretty daunting when you think about what the actual range of concentrations is. You know, some com proteins are there at a million copies, and some are maybe at 100. And certainly, there's going to be a lot of interesting stuff down here at these lower level proteins that we'd like to be able to look at. It's been estimated that, 70, that 15, the 1,500 most abundant proteins account for 75% of all the protein. So what that means is that if you just find any peak in your mass spectrum, there's three-fourths of a chance it's one of those 1,500 proteins, which means then that it's going to be really hard to find all those other proteins that are present uh, in, in the mixture. So you have over a million analytes, five orders of magnitude different in concentration. You take that, you put it in the mass spectrometer. Your mass spectrometer will work very hard and find lots and lots of proteins in there and peptides for you and do a great job of identifying many of them. But probably what it's going to find is those most abundant ones, OK? And it's going to have a hard time as you go down deeper into the proteome, the less abundant ones, and you're, and you're going to sort of run out of steam with uh, the complexity of that mixture. So the, the concept is to try to simplify the mixture before it gets to the mass spectrometer. There's a few ways to do that. I noticed some of them in the flash talks, taking pull downs, for example, of phosphorylation, um, and a few other things that, that were done to try to simplify the mixtures. We also can use continuous type separations like chromatography 
to essentially put subpopulations of these peptides that we've made into the mass spectrometer little bits at a time and allow the mass spectrometer to do its work on more simplified mixtures where it can do a lot better. Uh, and of course, a big reason for this is something that Josh alluded to in his talk, you know, when those, you get that initial mass spectrum before you do the MSMS, you'd like for that to be as simple as possible so that the mass spectrometer is able to pick out each individual uh, peptide there and then sequence it and give you uh, some, the information for that particular peptide. There's other issues too that you relieve by using the mixture. I mean, potentially for isomers, for example, in metabolites, you're gonna have this issue, especially lipids. And then also ionization suppression. So if, if multiple things are coming out at the same time in the, in the typically electrospheric process, there's, it's a competitive process for ionization. The most abundant and e most easily ionized things will tend to dominate what you see and they can even make it impossible, not just suppress, but make it impossible to detect those lower abundance, less ionizable things. So by allowing those uh, uh, particular peptides to come out on their own in a more simplified mixture, it gives them an opportunity to get into the gas phase as an ion and be detected. So this is why we really need separations, despite the fantastic advances in mass spectrometry. So let's, I know most of you are probably already familiar somewhat with chromatography. I'm gonna start at the beginning a little bit just and give you some basic terms, so, cause I'll be referring to them as I go along. But uh, you know, the, the, what makes the chromatography system is to have some sort of separation path. Typically it's just a tube that's filled with a material that will not be moving and we'll call that a stationary phase. And then we're gonna flow through that a mobile phase. And then when we put our sample at the head of that uh, tube or column, it'll start to be carried through by the mobile phase. But the different molecules will come out at different rates or move through their different rates based on how much they interact with that stationary phase. So there's gonna be chemical interactions with that stationary phase and different chemicals can interact differently. So different peptides act differentially with that phase. So you get that separation. Of course, you can actually watch it. If you have a clear tube as your uh, separation path, you can see a couple of dyes being separated there. Now, normally we don't get the image or separation like that, right? But what we'll do is we'll put a detector at the end and watch things come out at the end. So when you do that, you get a chromatogram. So you have this time varying signal uh, that you get and you'll see individual peaks for that. Now in those very complex mixtures, you don't actually get to see individual peaks a lot of times. It's just a jumble because there's so many things overlapping with each other. But what's happening is each peak is coming out as its own little zone or band as you see there. And a um, couple of important things here. One is where it comes out, that's the retention time. That can tell you something about that molecule, how much it's interacting with the stationary phase. Of course, you need differences in retention time in order to actually get a separation. So that means you have to have differences of interaction. And then the second thing that's really important is how wide these peaks are. And chromatographers absolutely obsess about peak width. And I'll, so I will obsess a little bit about that today with you. So first of all, we like to think of different ways to measure that. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> excuse me. So if you look at these peaks, they're kind of a Gaussian shape, and that means you basically have a random distribution of retention times for all the particular type of molecules you have, and you end up with that Gaussian distribution. And so you can describe the width as a standard deviation. You can also describe it as a variance or sigma squared, or you can just measure the width in time units. Um, now, that would be easy if we just left it there, but chromatographers don't like to do that. We have other things we use. We have a couple of very arcane sounding terms, one called plate height and one called theoretical plates that are very important, you'll hear about a lot. And uh, if you wanna know where those come from, I will explain uh, later, or happy to answer questions about that. But plate height is a term that measures the variance of those peaks over the retention time squared times the length. And so you can see here that what this is kind of telling you is the rate of broadening that you get. Uh, and, and that means you'd like for that to be a small number. So in other words, it's broadening per unit time. And so the smaller that is, the less broadening you have as you move things through the column. And then we also have something called theoretical plates or efficiency that's in. That's gonna be the retention time over the width of the zone squared. And there's, you can do it different ways so you end up with different uh, multipliers there. But that tells you, you'd like for that to be a big number because that means I can move through a very long retention time and keep my peak quite narrow, okay? So we like large efficiencies, good columns can generate 100,000 plates. We like small plate heights, they can be as small as a few 
micrometers if we measure them in length units, okay? Um, so, and there's that, this is the relationship between the two, two the, uh, the column length. Okay, so that's a few things about the chromatograms that you get. Uh, one other really valuable term that we will, uh, I will use a lot, and this is really important for complex mixtures, is something that's a property of your column called its in sample, which is called peak capacity. Peak capacity is the maximum number of compounds you could possibly separate on the column, okay? So you can see here, all these peaks are about as close together as you want them to get, and so there's nine peaks there. The peak capacity is nine in that case, okay? So the way you get that is just the analysis time, total analysis time you have available, divided by the average peak width. So high peak capacity means that you can separate a lot of compounds potentially with the uh, chromatograph. The highest peak capacities you're gonna see for one column are gonna be on the order of 1,000. That would be really, really high. Most are gonna be more like a few hundred, just to give you an idea. It's not as much as 10 million, right? All the peptides I talked about but it's enough to try to help the mass spectrometer do its job, okay? So I think chromatographers will have a job for a while because we're nowhere near what we need to be able to do. Okay, now I wanna get into a little bit about operating columns and how to sort of maximize that efficiency or minimize that plate height to get to the best possible performance. And the most Basic thing that we will show is this something called a Van Diemter ply, which many of you may have seen before if you've had an analytical class. But this is the plate height versus the velocity. And what we see experimentally is that there's sort of this U-shaped curve for that plate height versus velocity. That means there's an optimum, so you'd like to operate down here in terms of just getting the best possible efficiency because this is the least about a band broadening right here. But we often, have to balance that against time, okay? So everyone complains chromatography is too slow, so we would like to go faster, flow faster, that gets the chromatogram over quicker, but you see what we're paying a price there, we're getting worse and worse efficiency as we go faster. So a lot of research is done in trying to flatten out that curve there so they can go to faster flow rates and get that. Now the reason you have this optimal uh, range here is because there's multiple effects coming in and contributing to band broadening. They're all independent of each other. So we don't have time to get into these different effects here, but as we go along, I will try to tell you examples where we've minimized A term, B term, or C term to give rise to better chromatography, okay? But I do wanna show you an example here, kind of a dramatic example of why improving efficiency or what it can do for you in a complex mixture. Now this has nothing to do with mass spectrometry. This is a gas chromatography example with a flame ionization detector. And here's an example of a column, sort of a standard gas chromatography column with a packed bed. And you, it's a complex mixture, I believe it's an environmental sample. So it looks like you did a pretty good job. There's lots of peaks there, you separate them, you know, you think you're doing pretty good. And then we now make a new column that removes the A term. Okay, it's a different style of column, different shape. We get rid of the A term, and we make it a lot longer. So longer columns give you more efficiency as well, right? And all of a sudden, you see a whole lot more peaks. So you can see how sharp these are. This is a, that's not just a noise spike. That's an actual chromatographic peak compared to what these look like there. And so with those narrower peaks over time, you see many, many more things being resolved. And so without the mass spectrometer, this was absolutely important you know, critical to be able to understand the complexity of that mixture. Now I wanna go through a little bit more about why we like to keep peaks narrow with a bit more emphasis on when we're interfaced to mass spectrometry, okay? So first of all, if I have two peaks that are a given distance apart and they're this width, you can see that there's gonna be a, quite an area in there when the mass spectrometer is seeing both of those compounds. Okay, and so that's gonna give rise to more complexity in the chromatogram. Now I'm showing you two, just for simplicity. Again, we're talking about millions of compounds coming out, this will be many more compounds that you're looking at at the same time. Now if I can keep the peaks narrower, you see there's much less time where I'm seeing both of them, so the interference is less. I'm gonna be more likely to get cleaner mass spectra, easier to deal with and identify. 
Another reason you like to keep peaks narrow is it increases sensitivity. If I have a given number of moles injected onto the column for a given compound and it spreads out over this kind of time, this would be sort of the concentration change over time, and it might look like that. If I can keep it narrower in time, that same number of moles in a narrower time is going to give me a higher concentration when it comes out. Higher concentrations, easier to detect in the mass spectrometer. You get more signal, and better signal is going to be better mass spectra for identifying things. So really valuable there. Finally, uh, when things are co-eluting, you're going to have more of this ionization suppression effect, which I mentioned before. And by resolving them in the liquid phase before they get to the electrospray source, you can uh, prevent that to a greater extent by getting them resolved. So three big reasons why you get better improvements on your mass spectrometry data by having better separations. Here's a real example of this, published several years ago now by uh, Ian Wilson. It's a metabolomic analysis. He compared a column that had a peak capacity of 75 to one that had 250. And this is now a 3D plot. You don't see these a lot, but it's a retention time, M over Z, and then a signal going up. And so this is what the data looked like with a 75, a compound, a column that had peak capacity of 75. And now here we are with 250. You see many minimal peaks being detected there readily in that 3D plot. Um, well, the reason for that is all those things I mentioned. We're reducing ionization suppression, we're getting less interference, we're getting, resolving more isomers, and so on. And what they also showed in this paper is how it actually improved their ability to distinguish groups in the metabolomic analysis, different types of samples, and get better compound identification. So it, it goes a long way. Okay, so that's a bit about terminology why we want to have separation. I want to move in a little bit more specifics about doing separations. And so if you're going in, and of course most of you will probably go into a lab and say we're going to do LC, okay, <laughs> and that's what you're going to do. But if you have a choice, um, you know, you might want to think about why. So there's sort of two main flavors of chromatography, one with a gas mobile phase or gas chromatography, one with a liquid mobile phase or liquid chromatography. There's a third called supercritical fluid chromatography that's pretty cool. Um, and uh, it has some very nice properties, but has not quite broken into the omics fields very much yet, so we won't talk about that. So GC is by far the best types of chromatography. You get much better separation by GC than by LC. If you can do anything by GC, that's what you should do, okay? Now, it turns out that it's only good, though, for compounds that are volatile and you can get into the gas phase. So that kind of relegates it to working at small molecules, metabolites, and in some cases, lipids. Um, but it's had great use in particularly metabolomics. Now, things that aren't volatile or that would be too temperature sensitive to volatilize, that means they have high polarity, high molecular weight, you're going to need to use liquid chromatography so that, because you can keep them in the gas state. And that's going to be, so it's a liquid chromatography, even though it doesn't give you the same efficiency, has much more versatility for analysis. Okay. Uh, in terms of interfacing to the mass spectrometer, gas chromatography again has an advantage because uh, the types of ionization sources available, chemical and, uh, and electron impact ionization are pretty cool. Electron impact, you can get a lot of fragmentation, so it's a hard ionization source that gives you compound identification. Um, or you can use soft ionization and uh, sources, uh, which is not listed on the slide here, and just look at the individual peaks more. With liquid chromatography, we normally use electrospray. It's a pretty soft ionization source, so you tend to get molecular ions coming out. And as Josh said before, that's a good thing because then you can go and get the MSMS spectra for the compound for doing identification. So we have that capability. So a little bit about, uh, I sort of already showed this with the earlier slide, so I won't go through it too much, but a little bit now about liquid chromatography. So the stationary phase is normally uh, a bead that's been packed into the column. So I, I should say there's a support, which is made out of silica beads that's packed into the column. On that silica is the stationary phase. We'll talk a little bit about what those are in a second. So you have this bed of beads here, and we're flowing our mobile phase through and then uh, through the column. And it turns out that there are these beads present a pretty high resistance to flow, so you need a good pump on the front end 
And when you go to buy them, you're shocked at how much that pump can cost. But um, it uh, will create the flow for you through the, through the mobile, through the column. So again, if you're doing a separation, we inject at the beginning. And then uh, compounds that don't reinteract with that stationary phase very much will come out first, in yellow. And then ones that interact more can come out later, the green. So in terms of that stationary phase and the format of the, the particles, there's a lot of things available. The most common that you're going to see for an omics type thing is partition chromatography, where this is supposed to represent a particle here, that kind of glob. So the particles are porous. <clears throat> so they have the, the rough parts here are supposed to represent the different pores. Silica, we coat a liquid on there or bond a thin film of phase on there and analytes partition in and out of that thin film. And we'll talk about what those films might be in a minute. Uh -huh. Let's see. Sorry, this has a lot of animation I didn't mean to use. Uh, but there are other formats, like adsorption chromatography, where the stationary phase is literally just the surface functional groups on that solid. Ion exchange, where we put, for example, cationic surface groups and then allow anions to be retained there. Uh, Size exclusion can be used as well, not typically interface directly to mass spec, but maybe as a uh, cleanup step. And here we're not, it's not really a chemical interaction so much as a physical exclusion from pores, so bigger things can't get into the pores. They don't slow down when they get in those pores, so they keep moving, bigger molecules coming out first. And then down here, affinity chromatography, many of you are familiar with that, and we'll talk more about that in a minute, where we select out a particular type of compound based on antibody interaction or some other specific interaction. So again, most of the time for omics, you're going to be looking at that partition type <coughs> phase. So in terms of the different types of uh, partitioning that you can have, <coughs> two big flavors for us. One is reverse phase, and one is normal phase, also uh, a version of that called HILIC, which stands for hydrophilic interaction liquid chromatography. In reverse phase chromatography, our stationary phase is going to be something kind of hydrophobic, typically an alkyl chain like a C18, C4, C8, something like that. There are some variations on that uh, listed here. You might hear these terminology like aqueous C18 and so on, polar embedded. Uh, don't have time to get into that, but I'll be happy to help explain what those are if anyone's curious. Uh, on the hillock side, where we have a uh, Typically, you'll see the surface will be something like this amino or cyano group, but the actual stationary phase is actually a layer of water that gets adhered to the surface of the, that particle. And so things partition into the water and then out into the mobile phase. So those are the two types of surface that we use. And the mobile phases that go with that are chosen to allow an interaction with that C18. So typically, we have like a water uh, with methanol or a C nitrile mixture allows things to partition from the water into the C18 type phase. And that's also important because that'll solubilize your sample. And then over here on the hillock polar phase, we tend to use more nonpolar solvents as the mobile phase. So in terms of what you choose, you know, reverse phase is extremely general. It's useful for almost, because most things can interact at least a little bit by dispersion forces and other things with the C18 type phase. So you can separate proteins, peptides, lipids, and metabolites. The main weakness here is really polar compounds. They may not interact very, like sugar, stuff like that. They may not interact very well with the, the reverse phase. So that's where hillock comes in. And also things like lipids and glycans that have a nice hydrophilic regions are good to separate here. So those are your main choices. Ion exchange, I mentioned before, is also another choice. So reverse phase. Very dominant. I think 70, 70 to 80% of the columns sold are reverse phase columns in liquid chromatography. Uh, so just a little close up here, you have your surface. We've got these alkyl chains typically sticking off the top. And uh, this slide is meant to depict uh, how we actually do the elution or separation of our compounds. So if we start off with a pretty aqueous mobile phase, then most of our peptides are going to not like being in that water. If they're hydrophobic at all, they're not going to like being in the water. They're going to partition into that uh, hydrophobic phase and stick there pretty well. So only the hydrophilic peptides will really be moving very well down the column because they won't, they'll like the water. 
But then what we can do is actually increase the organic content of the mobile phase over time. And as we make it a little bit more hydrophobic of a phase, then we can start to pull these guys out of that uh, C18 phase, allow them to start to elute. And then finally, at the most organic content, like 100% methanol, you'll get all of the uh, hydrophobic peptides coming off and going into the mass spectrometer. So when we change the organic content over time, that's called gradient elution. And that is really important. We have very, we have mixtures that have very wide range of hydrophobicities. If you were just to fix at one mobile phase composition, especially with peptides, what you'd find is some elute and a lot never come off the column. And so we need that gradient elution to give you this wide range of, uh, uh, to deal with those wide range of polarities. And I'll talk a little bit about the end about how you might manipulate that gradient for better peak capacities. So inside your column, if you were to empty it and make your boss really mad because of how expensive that column was, and then look at it under a microscope, you could find the, those little beads that are in there. And they're going to be anywhere, you know, they can, you can buy them anywhere from 50 micron down to 1.7 micron. Uh, the only reason to show the 50 micron here is you can actually, if you look closer, you can actually see the pores in the surface of that. So we like to have those pores that lets things diffuse in and then create a thin layer of stationary phase. We like to have thin layers of stationary phase. So we get a lot of stationary phase in a thin layer by having a porous particle. Now, you'll never do a separation of complex mixture on 50 micron. We're going to be looking at 5 micron and below for uh, complex mixtures. But you can, so you can just see the, the size differences there. Um, now, a couple of things here. These particles have a huge impact on the plate height and efficiency and ultimately the performance of the column. So smaller, turns out, are going to give you lower plate heights and higher efficiencies. So we love smaller particles. So if you watch over time, you'll see people you know, uh, selling you smaller and smaller particles. And that's because they're going to get higher and higher efficiencies with those kind of columns. Now there's a problem there though that those smaller particles have higher pressure requirements too to get things through the column. So you need more and more expensive pumps to get the fluid to go through there, right? So that's, a, that's an issue. Um, we like that porous material because it gives you more stationary phase in a thin film. Now the, that's typically good, but the pores also create our own source of band broadening. So we want to try to minimize them if we can. And I'll show you an example a little bit later, this core shell idea that can sort of a compromise in terms of giving you lots of stationary phase and a thin film, but uh, low, low band broadening from the pores. So uh, a little bit more terminology here, LC, HPLC, UHPLC, what's the difference, okay? Well, when we first started doing chromatography, I showed you that, that glass column. That was a gravity feed column. If you walk into an organic lab, you'll probably see them still doing column chromatography that way, uh, relatively low resolution, big particles. Uh, then we had the advent of HPLC in the 70s and up into the 2000s. This would typically be particles in the five to 10, three to 10 micron range. The pumps you needed were, could generate about 400 bar. Uh, but nowadays we use even smaller particles sub two micron they'll call 1.7 micron and you're going to need pressures over 700 bar so you need a higher, better, higher pressure pump 1.7 micron particles and that will be UHPLC typically. So that's a lot about particles they're certainly super important. Now another thing if you're doing omics a lot of times you'll think about is how big of a diameter of a column do you want to use okay. And this is a graph showing you uh, the effect of column internal diameter on sensitivity. So you can see as we start off with 2.1 millimeter down here is sort of the standard. Flow rates are over 100 microliters per minute. Um, as we get smaller and smaller inner diameter, we get better and better sensitivity. So this is to do with two factors. One, the electrospray ionization can be more efficient. The other thing is if you think about if I take a given amount of material and I put it in a very small inner diameter column, I've increased its concentration. And so it's going to be easier to detect those things, better sensitivity. If you take the same thing, put on a bigger column, it's going to be more diluted as it comes out, harder to detect. Okay, so you get better sensitivity for two big reasons there. 
And that's a big reason most of the proteomic stuff is done at 75 micron ID. So uh, the nano flow is also preferred for a few other reasons here, uh, but I think sensitivity is probably the main thing that really drives that. And these columns look like these little brown capillaries. That brown is just a polyamide coating on the outside of a clear fused silica capillary. So I mentioned already that long columns can help you, and I've told you that small particles can help you. This is a nice graph that sort of puts all that together. It's looking at uh, the peak width in different colors as a function of column length and uh, uh, particle diameter. And you can kind of see that we're getting better and better as we go to smaller particles and longer and longer columns. So this upper left quadrant is where you like to be, um, but that's also where you run into pressure limits. So smaller particles, harder to flow through, longer columns, harder to flow through. So you kind of get blocked out there. Uh, so you'll see a lot of work done at these 20 to 25 centimeter length with sub two micron particles as being the best compromise for what you can do with current technology. So you can make your own columns, okay? You can pack columns yourself. It's actually, this is it's very hard. It's actually not that hard. Uh, but I would say that if you don't do a good job, you do get terrible results, okay? So, and the reason for that is that columns are really, really picky about how well those beads have been put in there in terms of the performance you get. So here's just an example of trying to pack some 0.9 micron particles. The little hole there, okay? Doesn't look like much, you got all those beads that are in there nice and close together, two little holes, that'll kill the chromatography, okay? So, just the way it is. Now here are these 1.7s, much better, more uniform packed. So, uh, like I said, many labs pack their own columns, or you can buy your own, they're pretty expensive, as you probably know if you look at the cost, um, but uh, you can do either way. Um, I mentioned the particle format, and we talked about going down to smaller size, um, I want to uh, talk a little bit about something you might hear about, which is a core shell or superficially porous particle. These are pretty neat, okay? Because what you can do is have a particle that's this size, has a solid core, and then a porous layer around the outside. And please ignore those arrows. I'm not sure what they're supposed to mean. I, <laughs> it implies there's flow going through there, which there isn't. Um, so the bigger size means that they have lower back pressure, but the superficially porous means that a molecule doesn't diffuse all the way down there and diffuse all the way out, it only has to diffuse this layer, uh, these superficial layer, and that is a, will tend to decrease band broadening. So these give you band broadening of a smaller particle, but back pressure of a bigger particle. Now, they can be a little bit more fragile, uh, and so you can't use them at higher, as high of a pressure. Um, uh, for really long columns, um, but uh, th they do offer some interesting advantages for performance at, at lower pressure. So you can get, for example, at lower pressure, pretty comparable performance here to a, a superficially porous, or a fully porous smaller particle. A couple of other things, so I've, everything I've talked about assumed that we have little beads packed into a tube, and that is easily the dominant type of chromatography, but there are a couple other pretty cool formats that are coming online. Some of these are commercially available that I think you should probably think about if you were uh, interested in trying to improve separations or trying something different. One is a monolith. This is a picture of one here. So it's, it's a capillary tube that you're looking at end on. And they've actually polymerized the support for the stationary phase inside that. And then the stationary phase can be attached separately or done during the polymerization. So you don't have now individual beads, but this polymer network, and there's two kinds of pores, bigger ones that flow goes through and smaller ones that add, hold that stationary phase for you. These tend to give you lower back pressure, so you can make a really nice long column uh, and have pretty low pressure. So I've seen nice results, four meter long columns actually, uh, with these kind of monolithic columns. Uh, they're a little harder to get, much harder to make uh, than a pack column though. Another kind of exciting thing coming online is actually microfabricating the column. So rather than waiting for the bees to just randomly pack into the bed, we're going to actually go in and purposely design our packed bed exactly the way we want it, 
through microfabrication. So this is actually a silicon rod that's a, uh, maybe 30 microns high, and there's not a scale bar, 30 microns high and maybe uh, a couple of micro, uh, I think it's like three microns wide or something and little two or five micron gaps between them. And then the flow goes into the, into the board there. So through those uh, beads. So instead of beads, you have those little pillars. Stationary phase is coated on the outside of the pillars. So these, again, have better permeability, very good efficiency per unit length. There's a few issues with these, though, that I would caution you about if you were thinking about them. Um, this says no integrated emitter. That's true. You know, you have this microfabricated bed, and you have to add the emitter on the other end. Another more insidious problem is this. Let's say you're using one of these columns. They cost 1000 bucks, maybe more, maybe 1600 And then let's say you, oops, you inject the wrong kind of sample in there, and it clogs the first part of the column, OK? That whole column is dead. I mean, this, just, you know, you just put it in the trash, you know, one of those, and you don't tell the boss about it, and you pull a new one out. Um, but if you had a capillary that you packed yourself, you just cut the end off, maybe put a new frit in on the inside, and you're ready to go, OK? So uh, it's. That, and then also I would say that the number of stationary phases that you can get on these kind of columns is way, way less than what you can get with a pack bed. So another limiting factor there. But still a very cool format, some very high efficiency. If it's the right column for you, you know what kind of samples you're putting on, it's pretty cool. Okay, so I wanna move now and talk a little bit about multi-dimensional separations, which can be very valuable for uh, complex mixtures. So, I've talked everything so far about assuming one dimensional separation, and we can represent our peak capacity another way here. So we have time going this way, and each little block would represent where one peak could fit. And so we have our peak capacity there, and that's what you get, okay? But imagine you could take each of those blocks and separate them again going up. And so now you get all this space to separate your components in. It's actually a multiplicative effect. So if I had a column that had a peak capacity of 100, and then I took another column that had a peak capacity of 100 and could separate differently than the other one, it's, no, it's, now, it's not 200, it's 10,000 peak capacity. So that's the way to really rapidly get a huge gain in peak capacity for separations. Now, many of you are probably familiar with the classic example of two-dimensional separations, which is 2D electrophoresis. You separate on a gel by size, and then you separate in a gel by, this says pH isoelectric point, and it's a pH gradient, so you separate by isoelectric point. So now your proteins are separated out in this two-dimensional space. Peak capacity is at literally 10,000 with this type of separation, so it's you know the highest resolving method for intact proteins that there is, actually, in terms of separations. It's been around a long time. If you've ever done one, though, you know it takes a long time. <laughs> uh, but this is uh, the very high resolution separation. Now, this is hard to interface to mass spectrometry. So, but you can do this by chromatography as well. So, for example, an easy way to do it is to use a one-dimensional uh, column, collect fractions from that. This shows you collecting, what, maybe 10 or dozen fractions, and you take each fraction, run it on a nice long reverse phase gradient, and you've simplified the mixture even more before you get to that separation. You can really improve your peak capacity that way. Uh, here's an example from our lab where we did exactly that. This is for lipids. We separate lipids by their head group with a helix phase, so the lipids have a polar head group, and this is helix good for that. Then we took each of those fractions and separate them by their tail groups by reverse phase chromatography. So it's each, each of those chromatograms from each uh, lipid fraction looks very different. And if you actually look at where all those peaks come out, uh, it, the, the different fractions from dimension one and the different separation times are very well spread out there. So we had a peak capacity about 1900 and 10 hours for that. Uh, with proteomics, you can do the same thing, and often it turns out surprisingly that just varying the pH between two reverse phase columns is pretty effective, okay? But there's different ways to do those combinations. And finally, a great way to simplify a mixture before you do that uh, uh, digestion and reverse phase chromatography is some sort of affinity method. So if you want to go after the phospho proteome, for example, you could use beads that have uh, metal affinity 
and pull out the uh, phosphopeptides. You can use antibodies for particular uh, modifications like acetylation or ubiquination and pull those particular proteins out and then analyze them. Lectins for glycosylation let you focus in on those. So this isn't so much a high peak capacity thing as much as letting you focus in on a fraction of the proteome for analysis. So uh, I showed you that you could do 2D by doing one column, collecting fractions, and then injecting that onto another column and doing fractions. You can actually, it'd be kind of cool if you could do this in the gas phase though, because one reason liquid chromatography is so slow is because you're trying to move everything through a viscous liquid. If you get it in the gas phase, things go a lot faster. That's why mass spec is so fast, because it's in a vacuum, okay? Um, so the idea would be we'll do our normal proteomic workflow, and then we do electrospray, and then somehow separate those ions before they get to the mass spectrometer, and then analyze each of those individual little separations. Well, the way to do that these days would be ion mobility spectrometry. So this is gas phase electrophoresis, basically. So the ions enter one end of a tube that's got an electric field applied across it. Flowing against them is a drift gas. So as molecules move through, they're gonna be moving faster according to their uh, charge to size ratio. But then the drift gas bumps into those molecules and the bigger they are, the more it's gonna bump into them and slow them down. And so you separate things based on what's called a collision cross-section. So the bigger you are, the bigger your collision cross-section, the slower you're gonna be able to move through that tube. So you can get a separation in gas phase that way. And the beauty of it is it can be done in a few milliseconds, so it's just the right speed to fit between a seconds wide chromatographic peak and a millisecond time mass spectrometry analysis, or microsecond time mass spec analysis. So here's an example just illustrating the speed of it uh, from our lab recently where we were doing a pretty rapid chromatography, 15 second chromatography, okay? It's a peptide digest of an antibody. And then interface that to an ion mobility uh, instrument before we got to the mass spec. And you can see what's kind of cool here is like things that didn't get resolved by chromatography, like here, you see a peak there, a peak there, a peak there, they're all resolved in the ion mobility part. And then we get mass spectra on all those individual things at the same time. We actually estimate the peak capacity of this is about 400 in 15 seconds, so that's pretty good for, uh, for chromatography before it gets to an ion mobility, before it gets to mass spec. The one caution I would offer about thinking my ion mobility is a great second dimension, which it really is, is that it doesn't do anything about ionization suppression. If things were suppressed before they got to the, uh, uh, you know, as they were being ionized, you're not gonna see them by ion mobility either. So, the two-dimensional liquid phases are better for kind of accounting for that kind of complexity and what that might do to your chromatogram. Okay, do you okay on time? I think we started 15 minutes late, so I think you're good, yeah. Okay, so um, a couple of things now, a little practical tips here, and this may be the most useful thing I show you, uh, actually, which is because you know, if, you, if you have a system that you're using and you wanna know, okay, I've got this column, I've got this kind of pressure limit, I'm already sort of fixed on that side, how do I get the best out of my uh, chromatography? Well, gradient length, so when you set up your gradient, you can tell it how long you want that organic content to increase over time. And if you wanna save time and you can operate down here, but if you wanna get high peak capacity, which again is gonna definitely get you more peptides identified, uh, you can go to longer gradient lengths. And you can see there's sort of this trade-off here where as I go longer, uh, I get more, but eventually it sort of plateaus out a little bit, okay? So you can play with that gradient length within reason to get some improvement, but eventually you're gonna run out of, of improvement uh, that you get. Now this, Graph is also beautiful in showing you some of the things I've already shown you about how different column parameters affect the peak capacity that you're gonna get and ultimately the number of peptides you would probably be able to detect. First three graphs here have all the same reverse phase material, three micron particle, but they're longer columns. So you see as you go to longer and longer columns, you get better and better peak capacity. Like I said, that's higher efficiency, okay? Now, 
you get fancy and you buy the 1.7 micron columns, okay, suddenly even a 15 centimeter column is even better than your 50 centimeter three micron. So that particle diameter, huge effect, okay? And you can see here, 15 centimeter compared to that, it's like not even close. Um, and now the best 30 centimeter 1.7 micron, and you can see all the way up here. Now this graph kind of ends here because these pressure, you're now at the limit of the pressure of the system that you have, okay? So if you were to go to 50, 100 centimeter, presumably you get even better results, okay? But you're gonna need higher and higher pressure. Now we've actually built systems that can go to higher pressure in our lab and demonstrated that. Um, but right now commercially, I think uh, for capillaries, I think the limits are probably around 15, thousand PSI. So something like this. So anyway, these are things you can play with, but don't think keep going longer is going to help you that much. And by the way, when you do this, you can fix, fix the flow rate independent. So you can make your flow rate sort of optimal for detection and efficiency as well, and then change the gradient length. Um, okay. This <laughs> slide just reminds us that if we have analyze that have some identical property, like size, and we're trying to separate them by size exclusion chromatography, it's not gonna happen, okay? So if things have identical uh, property, that's not gonna be a good way to resolve them. But if you have multidimensional separations, you can still find, find ways to do it. Um, this gets back to reinforcing the idea about 2D being a very effective way to improve peak capacity, so here's Peak capacity is a function of time, how long it takes. And you can see that if you can in, invoke a two-dimensional separation, you can get big improvements in peak capacity over even better and better. So this might be, for example, your 1 DLC running longer and longer gradient times. You can see, okay, it sort of plateaus off here, but the 2D really ramps that up. And that kind of was illustrated with that 15-second run I showed you, which had a very high peak capacity in just 15 seconds, okay? But I will say, that if you're doing 2D LC proper, it's pretty, pretty uh, labor intensive. And then finally, um, this is important if you are making your own columns or uh, maybe you're buying from different vendors, extra column effects are really important. So if I just take a, a zone no stationary phase, no mobile phase, just a capillary tube, and I pump it through that tube or uh, capillary or channel or whatever, um, over time, it's gonna get broader, okay? And for example, if you have a, a empty piece of capillary between the end of the column and the beginning of the mass spectrometer, you're gonna get broadening as you move through that, okay? Um, but it's not helping you at all in the separation, so that's a real drawback for the separation. So what you'd like to do is minimize that extra column effect at the end of the column. So things that are packed all the way right to the emitter tip are gonna be better off than uh, having a, a, a column and then some kind of long capillary connected to it to the emitter tip. So you need to be cognizant of that. And you know, if you're seeing a lot of effects, maybe trying to shorten up the, the, the volume that you have between the um, end of the column and the, the mass spectrometer can be, can be valuable. So if you pack your own, you have complete control over that. If you're, you're buying it, you have to sort of investigate. Uh, finally, I'll point out, and this is something that Josh was hinting at, I think, a little bit before, is there's a real interaction between how good and, let's say, fast the mass spectrometer is and your chromatography that's quite interesting. So you can see here, the number of unique peptides that you take is a function of peak capacity. So I told you before, the, more, the higher peak capacity you have, the more uh, peptides you should be able to identify, but you see here it actually levels off a little bit, okay? So yeah, I lied to you. Um, well, this is because the mass spectrometer can only scan at a rate of seven scans per second, okay? And what was happening was peaks were eluding before the mass spectrometer ever had a chance to identify them, even though they were resolved, okay, or better resolved. Newer, fancier mass spectrometer gives you higher scan rate. All of a sudden, Bob's not a liar anymore. Uh, higher peak capacity gives you more peptides, okay? So there's that interaction between uh, being able to 
to scan. So it's kind of like always a race, like you need better and better separations, but eventually the separation is so good the mass spectrometer is not really keeping up. Or you have this great mass spectrometer and then your separation is so bad, it's, you know, you need better separation. So there's always this match between those two things. And so I think it would be quite interesting, these new 200 hertz overtraps to see what happens there. But this is sort of, a, I think, probably state of the art in the Kuhn lab at the moment. Okay, with that, I'll close. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. It's great to see all of you here. Um, yeah, if you have any questions. I'll run around with a microphone. If anyone asks a question, I'll be so impressed with overcoming pre-lunch fatigue. That'll be quite good. Um, thanks for the great lecture. I had a question where I wanted to juxtapose capillary electrophoresis yep. and HPLC. So CE will have a flat flow and it has a better resolution, higher, um, no, more number of theoretical plates and higher peak capacity. But still, HPLC, it hasn't been able to beat in terms of separation. Yeah. So I was wondering, um, what do you think is the limiting factor for CE yep. in terms of bio applications? Yep. So uh, you should know I love CE. I have <laughs> many, many papers on capillary electrophoresis. And um, what I would say is there's a couple of things. A, a real effect has to do with sample loading and ability to deal with different quality samples coming in. Okay, so what I mean by that is the chromatography column, if I have, a, let's say, uh, 10 microliters of sample and it's kind of salty, I have a capillary column and I've got peptides in there I'm interested in, I can take that 10 microliters, I can inject all that onto that column. That column will do a great job of concentrating and compacting all those peptides into a narrow zone at the head of the column and not go anywhere until I start to run the gradient. Meanwhile, the salts go out and I'm now running peptides pretty clean of salts, okay? If I had the same type of sample by, and I want to analyze it by CE, I got a big problem. The salts really interfere with the, detect, the, the injection process. Um, I'm gonna have to do some kind of sample prep, probably get rid of those salts so that the CE is uh, happy and then try to concentrate that sample again. So I think that those issues just never got worked out and they're so easy on chromatography. The second thing I would say is the interface to the mass spectrometer is a lot easier by reverse phase. You basically just apply voltage and stick it in front of the mass spectrometer. It's pretty robust. The CE is getting better and better. I mean, we, you know, it used to be kind of hard. I'd say it's better and better now, and, and there's more robust types of interfaces, but it's definitely an issue. Third thing is I'd point my finger at the instrument companies. I don't think they've done a good job of making the CE. There's so much capability there. You see individual labs uh, publishing on some fantastic results by CE, and the instrument companies just haven't really kind of created the ecosystem so that someone can buy it and use it. So I would say those are the three things that are holding CE back at the moment. But, you know, I always hold out hope because it is it is a fantastic technique. It would be great to have this as another option for people compared to the chromatography. Because you're right, it is higher efficiency per ton. On the plot you were showing us with um, the column length, the diameter of the particles, and then the median peak width that results, I was wondering if there's a standardized set of compounds that's used um, to report those peak widths, and if so, what are those compounds? There are not standard compounds for, for reporting efficiency or plate height or those kind of data that I showed you before. Um, so that is very much something that you're, it's a great question, you'd want to know, are we talking about proteins or peptides or small molecules there and, uh, and, and figure that out. I think that was to show you sort of a generalized thing that yes, you get better results with uh, smaller particles and longer columns and then there's a pressure limit up there that stops you. That's the main point I wanted to make with that. But if you want to go, and that would be true of all kinds of molecules, okay? 
Um, but the actual peak widths would depend on the uh, stationary phase and the actual analytes that you have, okay? So good question. Now chromatographers, you didn't ask this, I'll just throw it in. Um, we do have a way of sort of accounting for differences in molecules. We sometimes use what are called reduced parameters. So we can do things like def divide out the mobile phase viscosity and the diffusion coefficient of the analyte, which are real big determiners of those plate height and plates, and get what we call reduced plate height and reduced velocity, and then do a lot of calculations with that. That's pretty handy um, as well to sort of compare proteins to peptides on different columns and stuff like that. Yeah. A couple. I've got the mic, sorry, I couldn't talk yep. over here. Yep. <laughs> um, great talk. Um, I was wondering for the 2D liquid separation, like practically when you do it, um, do you have to do the first liquid separation by hand and then you put your samples on your LCMS? Or do you add another column and solvent system? There are uh, as many ways to do that as chromatographers. Not quite, but um, what I would say is, the easiest thing to do is to have some sort of automated fraction collector or a grad student sit at the end of the column and collect those individual fractions. And then you got round one done. And then when you have a chance, go to the second column. And the beauty of doing it that way is you've got those individual fractions. Um, you can do things to them. You could derivatize them. You could evaporate them down and concentrate them. You can do all kinds of things. Um, and what we did in that. Uh, lipid one is we knew that, so one class of lipids was separated better with a long gradient, another class of lipids was separated with a slightly different gradient, and so we get optimized the gradient for each fraction, okay, with the limited number of fractions. Okay, there are online 2D systems that you can buy. Agilent sells one, for example, that's really nice, and you can, it just, as things come out of one column, they get loaded onto the next column, and boom, quick separation on that second column. The only downside about those is they're not super set up for interface to mass spectrometry. They're all bigger scale columns. It's very hard to do that on the nanoliter, nanoflow scale. So if you're doing proteomics, that's a bit of a problem. The third thing I'll mention is super cool idea that was invented by John Yates many years ago is to let you do nanoflow 2D. Basically what he did is um, pack a column himself with reverse phase material. Then he came along and he packed, filled only partially, and then he put a little bit of ion exchange material at the front end. And then he takes a sample, injects it in, uh, let's see, high, high salt, no, high, low salt, low organic, and everything just sticks to the ion exchange. And then he adds a little bit of salt and then runs an organic gradient over that. So you get a little fraction coming off of the ion exchange and then you separate it in the reverse phase and you can do that multiple steps. That was called Mud Pit. I'm not sure actually how many people do that anymore, but it's a very clever idea to do 2D in a capillary scale column without a lot of fiddling of collecting fractions and stuff like that. Yeah, so those are the three big ways, I think. Okay, we've got a question over here. Hey, thanks for the lecture. Um, I have a question about quantification, um, which at least for peptides is usually done by, or often done by like integrating the chromatographic peaks, do you ever get your chromatography so good that you lose, I guess, precision in, in quantification because the peaks are so narrow, or is that not really an issue in practicality? Uh, it can happen, um, for sure, especially if you're doing quick separations. You know, um, I think you, I would always, if you're trying to quantify by peak area, I would always look at the peak, and uh, a lot of times it's hard to see but um, try to figure out how many points you have on there. I mean, you can kind of tell if it's sort of jagged like this going up and down, and you want at least eight points across that peak or you're probably losing resolution and uh, precision or accuracy in the peak area if you don't have eight points across it. So it can happen for sure, yeah. Thanks. Any other, oh, hold on, here's one. Thank you for that talk. Could you speak a little bit more to ion mobility separations, like what accounts for how it's being separated and in what areas would it be useful? Yep, so ion mobility, uh, so ion mobility is just 
proliferated like crazy, and there's many different kinds of ion mobility spectrometers available at the moment. Um, and so, and I, I don't even understand, you know, half of them. So I will just tell you that the basic idea going back is that we need to get those ions, they have to be charged, okay? So we get them moving in one direction by applying an electric field across that separation path. Um, and so with, if it was strictly a vacuum, that would be a lot like a time of flight mass spectrometer, okay? But we flow that uh, gas in going back against them, that uh, collision gas. And what that does is, as I try to say, is you know that it's, it's moving at a it's low, low pressure, but it's moving against those gases, the, the ions which are moving the other way. And so a bigger ion is going to hit those more often and be slowed down. And therefore, it will come out be slower than the smaller ions coming out. So you can actually plot ion mobility not in time, but in collision cross-section as well on that x-axis. And in fact, that's one of the beauties of it is uh, collision cross-section is often pretty portable from instrument to instrument. So it'd be nice if we had the same thing in chromatography. You know, like if one person's retention time will not be the same in another lab. Um, so we don't have that same kind of reproducibility from instrument to instrument. Um, so um, yeah, so that's the, the main thing. Like I said, there's lots of ways of tweaking with those. The big difference is a lot of them is how they play with those electric fields, how they apply electric field, and they get all kinds of different effects there. But the main thing you're separating by is that cross section. Um, so basically a different size of ions is what you're separating. Maybe we have time for just one more question before lunch, if there's any more. Thank you for the talk. Um, I'm thinking of demixing strategies to solve the co elution problem. Have people looked at tunable surface charges on the uh, column to play around with um, separating particles on the basis of mass, or if uh, they've tried to create the islands that, uh, you know, Kolmogorov of islands that people have tried to do with uh, Lagrangian mixing on the pore scale to see if that could enhance separation? So uh, if I understand correctly, you're talking about like sort of having like some kind of pattern surface so that you could have an interaction that would be selective based on whether you can cover all of a charge or multiple charges at the same time. Yeah. Um, I don't think so that people, I'm not aware of that type of technology. I will tell you that though, that sort of by accident, you can see it happening, okay? For example, maybe the, I'm not sure this is exactly what you're talking about, but it's maybe analogous. So if I'm doing surface adsorption chromatography, uh, I have these OH groups on the surface, okay? Typically, silica surface. They'll have a sort of a type of spacing, typically based on the silica lattice that they're coming off of. If I have, uh, a molecule that's got two OH, OH groups like this, it can maybe interact with both of them at the same time. And if I have it like this, it can only interact with one at a time. This one's retained more than the other, and they're isomers of each other. So ortho, para isomers are separated like that in, in surface absorption chromatography sometimes because of that type of effect. So yes, that surface pattern can be detected sometimes, but I don't know that anyone's had enough control to purposely put in different types of uh, uh, islands or patterning on the surface for separation, especially within a, a porous network. But maybe like on a surface you could get that and sort of demonstrate that effect, which would be quite quite interesting. Yeah. Is my two-way explosion that, that, that's a 